Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let's start. Uh, welcome to the um, webinar series uh, in uh, research data information integrations. This is the third of our series. Uh, today we're going to be looking at storage uh, for research data. Uh, my name is Paul Wong. I'm your host today. Uh, my colleague Susanna and uh, Xiao Beng will be co-hosting today's webinar virtually with me. Research is certainly changing uh, globally. One change is that uh, there's greater emphasis in um, accessibility and reuse of data and uh, better management of, of research data leading to um, better research in the long run. Now, a unifying theme of this uh, webinar series is the idea of, uh, of the research data management life cycle, as I'll show you. The next slide. Uh, we have um, two previous um, webinars, one on research data management planning, uh, one on ethics clearance for research data. So today we'll be talking about storage allocations for research data. Now through this unifying theme of research data management lifecycle, we want to get a better understanding of how research data information is integrated throughout the life cycle. That means that we, we need to look at the connectivities of different enterprise systems to support uh, the management of uh, research data. Our speakers today, uh, today are from uh, Deakin University's uh, um, Christopher, who's uh, e-research director, uh, a big key senior librarian from um, University of Newcastle, and uh, Jay, uh, manager of uh, research data services at James Cook Universities. So I'm going to pass the uh, control to Christopher. Today I was just going to run over um, what we're doing at Deakin in terms of this space of integrating storage with uh, description and discovery, is where I've loosely um, described it. So I'll start the presentation if it's going to advance for me. So we've got a fairly loosely coupled ecosystem uh, to handle this at Deakin. Uh, which is great, it's flexible in design, but as I've said there, it's, it, it can for, causes a lot of confusion in practice and the, the, uh, I've had a lot of problem getting researchers engaged with the fabric because it is quite confusing and you'll see with the diagram I'll present in a couple of slides later um, what I mean. So just trying to disambiguate some of that and clarify uh, what the, the tools are about and how they can actually assist rather than inhibit um, publishing of data and, and using the storage is really what we're trying, what the focus is on at the moment. So in the describe space, we um, we implemented Redbox Mint under the um, City in the Commons and other ANS funded initiatives, and we call that research data footprints to describe the footprint of your research. We've got the discovery layer, so that uh, repository um, isn't what we present to the world at large. We feed that into our um, ASHA Funder Research Repository, which is called DRO, Deakin Research Online. And then that's what Research Data Australia harvests for the individual records. And the actual data that may be shared in an open way is made visible through a very simple, uh, very basic portal called the Deakin uh, Data Portal, which is basically just an Apache server on top of the data itself. <coughs> and I'll show demo of all these things later on to expand those, those screenshots. So when we were um, implementing this um, metadata repository, uh, we also implemented a research data storage system, which allows researchers to provision storage themselves. We didn't have any strict uh, requirements on that, so anybody can create a bucket to, to store data. Um, but it is aligned with that, that data portal when a researcher is ready to, they can publish the data itself and it will link those things together and that's what allows it to be exposed to the data portal. So how does this all fit together? This is the diagram I was talking about just before. So we've got various components and I'm sure most of you would be familiar with some of these systems in play, but basically the, um, the management system is the source of truth for project and party data around researchers that feeds this repository I was just talking about. The storage system can be, you, you can create um, storage and choose to link it to a project or not. We're quite flexible with that because we understand that the actual process of um, writing a grant can actually generate a bit of data so before success outcome. So we didn't want to 
dissuade people from using the central storage that we've got on offer. Um, and really, it was also a, a carrot to stop people buying external hard drives and storing data locally on their machines. So having that <coughs> resilient storage in our data center was a pretty key um, point for that service. And then the rest of it's pretty pretty um, familiar to most of you. So we mint DOIs against every data set that's created and expose that through to this, this fabric down the bottom. So it is a bit of a, a quagmire and does cause a bit of confusion, but with, with the presentation layer, which is our focus on the moment, it is, it is limited in that it's just a bucket of data and we're just presenting it as a list. And so the, the benefit to the researcher is limited and that's what our focus is on now, is looking at, well, how can we better make people aware of this storage that is available and how it should, is intended to be used and how can we better display some of the, the data that people are generating. Uh, at the moment, um, I'm getting a lot of people creating storage containers or collections and just backing up their whole hard drive to it and there's really no description and delineation to um, what how they're describing things. So it's really identified to me that there's there's pretty poor practice out there in terms of how people structure what they're doing. And so that's where our library um, staff are helping out a lot in that one-to-one -one or one-to-small group discussions around how better to describe and manage um, data in the, in the broader context. Uh, what I was also going to say there is we've got a, um, a portal at Deakin called Deakin Sync and we're looking to um, provide some context um, to what researchers are doing there around storage. And so when one of the ideas um, is to link, uh, present to the researcher if they've got a successful grant outcome, pre to, um, present to them the option of creating storage if we know we have, they haven't linked it um, to that project already. It's because we've got all that metadata there, we can actually leverage quite a lot. So with that portal, we can provide a lot of value and direct every, all the researchers to go there to say, okay, well, you may want to be creating some records because we can see the project's been running and it's near the end of its life cycle or um, at the earlier stages actually create storage to put the data in that you're planning to generate with that project. The other options in the presentation layer we're looking at are discipline specific or quite um, aggregated systems that allow you to display data for various different disciplines. So um, we're only just starting to look at how we can integrate these things into this this platform or this ecosystem. Um, some of those things are like a Mika for all different disciplines that may want to create collections and manage them themselves and use that as their presentation layer rather than just a bucket with a, um, an Apache index on top of that. Um, Figshare and MyTardis are bringing around image data, Figshare being quite general and looking at Figshare for institutions and how that could potentially play a part or MediaFlux, we're still really investigating all those different options. So that's the real ecosystem and I didn't want to go into too much um, on that and really wanted to show you how it all sort of functions. This is the red box system we have and most people would have seen that um, in the past. It's allowing you to um, create the data descriptions as, as we all are well aware. What I wanted to show you here was um, the, the process we go through for each of these and how the DOIs are, are linked into the actual the data portal side of things. So when the process is they create a metadata record and then when they're ready to publish the data, um, they click a publish in the, in the store, which I'll show you in a minute. And then the links for that come into here um, and it's published, it publishes this data portal link and you may be able to see on the screen the, the URL down the bottom, which keeps those two things in check. And then when you go to view that um, actual data collection, you can then see it on this data portal and which one was that? The interview data for some Papua New Guinea audio interviews. So we replicate the metadata from that footprints record um, and actually show the contents here to be able to download if you want to. But it's very, very basic. There's no packaging of that which would be really ideal. Um, there's no thumbnail sort of view of that. So you really you're just downloading in that first example there, 800 megabytes, and then you can actually understand what it's all about. So exporting the metadata of that MPEG file in this case is not really done at this point, and that's where I'm wanting to get some improvements to present that better. Um, the data store is this system here. It's just a, a web application that hooks into our corp, um, corporate storage that we have available. And what we've done is provided um, four collection types. 
and we allow researchers to create those activities. They can link those to a project and then they can create these buckets to store things. So they can create a, a traditional network attached file share, which is these little yellow icons and they can create any number of those. There's a no, no, nominal limit of 10, but they can create any and they are unlimited. They can put as much data in there as they like and that uses our, um, what technology we're we using now. We're using Isilon storage for that. So it means there's snapshots taken three times a day, one, one snapshot at the end of the day for three months. So they've got complete ability to restore files and manage their data very flexibly. Um, there is another one called a publishable file share. So when they're ready to publish data, they can create one of those. It's no different in terms of the technology, but it allows you to hook into the actual um, footprints record and then that little data portal link happens. The other one there with a the little star, this is an icon for a um, product called Simplicity. So we're providing a Dropbox-like service because we need a lot of researchers working with external parties and they've got a lot of issues sharing data externally. So they can use this service now to do, uh, provide that. So that's using our own on-premise storage with a, a synchronize or sync and share platform on top of that. So it gives them unlimited storage. Although unlimited in the sense that you need the storage on your local computer for that to really function. Um, but it has, has been very, um, it's taken up quite rapidly because people really want that capability without having to pay for a Dropbox account and, and use that storage. And the other collection which I don't have in this demonstration activity here is a wiki space. So we've got a uh, Confluence wiki instance which they can use for collaborative work internally. Um, and so the store, the research data store has really gone from storage as in storing data to actually a store as you'll buy things and so that's going to expand. We'll be providing a whole lot of other services through this research data store. So blog engines and Amica instances and a whole lot of different things will be provided through this one portal for researchers and it will all be tied together under this, this activity or this project banner. So a particular example I was going to show you is the um, is a Pacific Sea Star, but Mark here has got a um, some sequence data that he's produced and he wanted to make it open, so he's gone ahead and published that. He's um, created the our Fez Fedora Asher repository record through our footprint system, and then he wanted to share that to the world. So originally he he was working with a library and they. Um, stored the objects within the repository, which wasn't great. And so now they're um, provided through the data portal. And so you can um, download the gigabytes or megabytes in this case of um, files. And one thing I'm advising researchers is to really be descriptive about what that is. I'm sure people in his discipline understand what all those different file formats are, but it doesn't really have a overview sort of readme file that could describe it better. So we're working with them on that and uh, that's presented with that hookup through that, that link there and also is, is um, a link that's available here. So you can actually be taken straight to that record. All the DOIs map through to our research repository. So Footprints really is just a collection gateway that links those things together um, and allows the, the record to be curated as accurately as possible. So really, that's all I was wanting to cover off today. Can Chris talk more about the publishing function? Absolutely. Um, so really, it's, it's, we, we call it publish, but it's, um, it really just formalises a link between the two systems. They create a publishable file share, which is just a, um, a network attached storage location. Everyone should be fairly familiar with network attached storage, it's just a network drive. Um, and so, they would just have a folder like this to store things. Let's just say this workshops one, for example, is something they would store. They would structure their data within that space. And that's completely offline. It's not exposed to anyone other than themselves. And then when they're ready to publish um, the data, I'll just see if some of the, this is UAT, so the, I might get some errors, but um, when they're ready to publish the data, they can then click a publish button, quite simply. Yes, good, it's ready to go. So this particular folder, which is, fictitious because it's UAT, but when they're ready to publish they literally do that. It will then look at all their footprints records and provide a list of ones that they that haven't been published and they can just choose that. So um, in this example here I've already published against this other one, but this one here I could potentially do that. And then I can provide global access, so just say yep, anyone can get access, or I could restrict it to an AF member. So in some way you could limit down to anyone who's a member of the AF to 
who could see that. So that's sort of semi-open in terms of its collection. And then within a few minutes, that collection would be exposed through that data portal I showed you before. So you would see um, it would appear here, or if I logged in and it was restricted, um, it, there would be more exposed once I'm logged into the system. So anyone in Australia can log into this, this data portal, as you can see, and um, then see that. So that's how that, that's, that's working. All right, Chris, there's a whole bunch of other questions that are coming in as you do that. Um, and says, what's the maximum storage space a researcher can request? Is there a maximum, did you say? Yes, what is the maximum? None, it's unlimited. Oh, I thought they'll all like so, that one. <laughs> <laughs> so um, our IT are managing the growth and um, capital acquisition that has to happen and um, they deal with that as it goes. So yes, it's completely unlimited. Um, um, so this next question probably ties into that, which says, what's the cost of the implementation of what you have at Deacon, particularly the data storage costs? So there's no explicit cost. It's covered under our um, central central capital expenditure on storage. So it's just factored into all the storage that the university buys. So there hasn't been an explicit cost for this particular service. At the moment, there's just about, um, what are we up to? 100 terabytes with another um, 60 at another site. So nearly 200 terabytes is what we're looking at. So not overly large. We don't have any astrophysicists with a petabyte in their back pocket. So um, it's it's probably relatively small to most institutions, but it is it's covered under that. So they, they provision that under systematic um, procurement throughout the year. So every time they're, they're always negotiating a new price for that storage. So I don't have to worry about that, which is actually a luxurious position to be in. Okay. Um, so probably that ties into that is a couple of questions which sort of meld together. <clears throat> One that says, use of storage by external to deepen users. Most collaborations are now national, international. So is this possible so that the external to deepen users can use it? And there's another question very similar which says, is this service going to be available for researchers in other universities and is there storage size limitations for them? So the first bit um, is covered under that sync and share service um, where they can they can provision it. So a deacon identity can provision it and share that with colleagues they're working with at other institutions. Um, which, but there are limits to that because if you're synchronising to your own computer, you need the hard drive storage on your own computer, so there are limits. The traditional network attached storage, any deacon identity can access that because they can create a VPN connection, but the external people can't. So the way that's traditionally been handled at deacon is uh, we often make those collaborators um, we needed as a visitor to the university, and then they get access to the to the storage. So it's a little bit cumbersome, and I don't. It, it, but but most people know how to work around that and then follow that process. Um, and the last question, no, there wouldn't be the ability for non-deacon people to create the storage space in the first place. It really has to be instigated from deacon's perspective. Okay. Um, another one is. Are the researchers able to mint DOIs via this publishing method? Yeah, so in the um, footprints system, that's where the DOI is minted, uh, they are done by the library. So the library, when they're performing quality checks on the description, are performing the step of minting it. So it's done implicitly in that the workflow of a, a metadata record is curated by the library and they're the ones actually doing that, but it's a, effectively it's a business to business transaction that happens on every one of those records. So um, yeah, the okay. research themselves don't, but the library does it on their behalf. Okay, and then probably the last one, so we can keep to Paul's time, it says, is the, all the data stored on Deacon infrastructure or is it stored on national infrastructure, EDRDS or local e-research yeah. provider? So yes, it is all on Deacon infrastructure. So um, Amongst our four main campuses, we've got two data centres, and the, it's stored on the the data the, within those data centres and replicated on those two. So we haven't engaged with the um, the RDSI provision storage. Um, it's all purely within on premise, which our researchers like because it means they can, particularly if it's sensitive data, they can tick a lot of boxes in terms of their compliance that they need to ensure. Fantastic. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you for the, all those wonderful questions. Um, our next speaker um, is Vicky, so I'm just going to pass the control to Vicky. Thank you very much for the invitation to um, share what we're doing here at Newcastle. Um, so I'm just going to talk about um, from data to discovery uh, in terms of our research data storage and the connections that we have. So in uh, telling the Newcastle uh, story, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the systems and the tools that we have and then talk about the three workflows that sort of make up those systems and tools and the connections and integrations uh, between those. So to tell the story, I'm just going to introduce you to the systems and the tools um, that are in this space at Newcastle. So for research data storage, um, we have OwnCloud. Uh, we have an enterprise uh, version of OwnCloud here. Uh, for data archiving and publishing, we're using a tool, uh, a software app that was created for, to run on our cloud and it's called Crate It. Uh, for data management and registry for the data management and metadata curation workflows, we're using Redbox and Mint, similar to what um, Chris was just talking about. Uh, and for publisher discovery, uh, we're doing that via our institutional repository, which is NOVA here at Newcastle. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the, the workflow and how they all connect uh, and just describe that to you. And after I've done that, I've just got two uh, small videos, short videos that just actually just show you that uh, in action. So you can um, I'll tell you about it, then I'll actually show it to you. Uh, unlike Chris, um, I, I wasn't um, keen to do uh, a live demonstration because that would probably go wrong. So uh, I'm using it there. So for research, so the work, the very first, um, it, it, these are the three workplaces. So I'm just talking about the connections between uh, the two. So our research uh, data storage, so in that is our own cloud, uh, which is enterprise version, I think it's seven, that we're on at the moment, and that sits on, I think it's a petabyte. Uh, and on that, we have this app, which is Credit. And Credit was developed, uh, it's made in 2013. Uh, we started work on Credit. It was born from work that um, Peter Septon was doing University of Western Sydney or Western Sydney University, I should say, um, at the time, and it was a collaboration between University of Newcastle, uh, Western Sydney, uh, Intersect, who were doing the development, uh, and in those early days, University of Sydney as well. So, um, credit was about the problem that, that we had identified in the library about wanting to have this connection with the research data storage uh, to, uh, to hook into our data management uh, and publishing workflow. Uh, for Redbox and the Mint. So, and since Credit was developed, or the, the development started way back in um, 2013, there's been a few development cycles along the way. Um, so there's been a few sprints and agile developments to get it to where it is now. And also there's um, some future development coming, which I'll tell you about at the end. So in, our, in that workflow, that research data storage workflow, that's what's sitting there. Uh, in the data management publishing one, we have, similar to Chris, Redbox and the Mint. So the Redbox is our metadata, metadata stores um, descriptive uh, curation workflow. And it's hooked up to the Mint, which is our name authority service um, for, our, uh, uh, for our party records, our, our staff members, our researchers, um, and also for, um, I forgot what I was going to say, <laughs> um, uh, our grants, sorry, that's what I was looking for, uh, information about our grants. And then uh, that's connected to um, NOVA, which is uh, for discovery. Sorry, I'll just, so just run through quickly. Uh, so in the um, research data storage workflow, that first one there, what um, researchers do there uh, or users of it, they log into the own cloud um, environment that we have. They create a crate. A crate is a, a data crate. Um, they add files to that crate, and the files are the files that they, they're working files from there that they have on own cloud, so they add it to the crate. Uh, then they have the opportunity in Crate It to also add metadata, and from there they can review the metadata and then they can publish the crate. When they publish the crate, it moves across, uh, a couple of things happen, one of those is it comes to the library, into the next workflow, that data management and publishing and the researcher receives uh, an email with a lot of rich metadata in it. And then in the data management and publishing workflow, the one sitting in the middle there, that's where the library uh, works on 
the metadata that's come across, the alert that's come across from Freighter. So that alert arrives into that system. Um, the library works on it, so we augment the metadata and we add metadata, and we um, probably have more conversation with the, the researcher to actually uh, work on permissions and probably more on descriptions. And when we're happy with that, we publish a record and it goes across into NOVA um, for discovery up through Research Data Australia. So this is Vicky's highly sophisticated systematic diagram. Um, so um, what's, it's just a way of very simply demonstrating um, sort of what's happening. So we've got OwnCloud. Uh, the researchers are in there with their, their, their storage, their working files. I should say that OwnCloud is just one of the storage options we have at Newcastle. But if you want to have the connections to publish, um, OwnCloud is where um, we have the ability to do that in the capacity. So from the Credit tool, uh, two things happen. When a researcher uh, uses Credit and they publish uh, or submit a data crate, they press the button, which I'll show you shortly, uh, two things happen. So a metadata alert goes across to a red box system and it's like the butt of a record. So it's an alert that has information that's been collected while the research has been working in Credit. Uh, the second thing that happens is that the data crate itself, so a zipped up file, and it uses the Bagot um, specification that came out of the California Digital Library. Um, that data set and then actually uh, data crate goes into our storage, uh, uh, storage layer. Uh, so the metadata alert goes across and it's ingested into Redbox. So more work happens there uh, in Redbox to augment that. And then from Redbox, we send uh, a mark, a DC, and a RIF CS record uh, across to Nova. Embedded in that, from that metadata alert uh, information all the way through that process, travelling with it is the URL to the data crate in the storage um, layer. So uh, the institutional repository. Uh, has a priv interface uh, into the storage layer, so uh, it's able to be the gatekeeper uh, for the access to the data. So if it's publicly available, uh, it's only publicly available uh, to Nova uh, through that priv uh, network access. So just quickly, um, this is a very uh, three-minute video, um, of quickly just demonstrating what I've just told you in terms of own cloud and create it. So the researcher logs in, they see all their files in OwnCloud. Uh, they're able to toggle up and they'll see a little icon that's called Crate It. They can, by default, they have a default crate for their data, but they can create a new one. So I'm going through the process of creating a new crate. So this is my study on green frogs. Uh, so it's collecting the metadata to go. Uh, and this is a description. Uh, on my crate. So then I fix my typo and I click to create and now I have a crate. It's just told me up the top there in yellow that I've got a new crate. Now I'm toggling and I'm going back to my files on OwnCloud and now I can add by right clicking um, the credits will let you add to the crate. So I'm just adding in my data dictionary, my um, population um, information on frogs, my environmental information, and I've got some images. But basically you pick and choose what it is as the researcher you want to package up that goes into that data crate. Um, and when you've finished, it's telling you as you go that it's adding things to the crate so you can actually see it. So we'll go back to Crate It, and we shall see the files have gone into our crate. Now, over on the right-hand side, the researcher or the user has some ability to add some metadata uh, around those files that will go with that crate. And this ultimately is going across to start the, the butt of a record uh, for the library to augment to for publishing. So there's a few things here. So with crate information with the title, the creators, um, we're just adding them now. It's hooked up to our Mint system. So it's actually doing a lookup against the Mint and it's bringing it back. It's hooked up to the Mint again and it's searching for grants. So we can select the grant and pull that information back in um, and so forth. So there's some more work going on around what actual metadata should be here, which I can tell you a little about 
There's a feature to check the crate to make sure that all the items are valid and still there since you added them. If you want to hit the button to submit, you get to review all the metadata that you've entered. At this point, you can go back and change it. Or you can hit the submit button. And that submit button is then sending it through for the research data storage, the data crate information to the library. So you can send an email uh, to additional people that you're working with to say that that's what's happened. So that's how um, Crate it is running on OwnCloud. The researcher can also zip up the, uh, the data crate, uh, a copy for themselves, and also um, save elsewhere if they want to. So the submit button has done two things. It set that, crate, that data crate or that data set to storage uh, for archival purposes. And then it's actually sent it across to the library. Uh, so this is our red boxed instance, which is not publicly available. It's a tool that the library uses, so it's fairly as is. And I'll just start the process to show you what happens here. So when you're logged into the system, the very first thing you see in the alerts is an alert that's Hunter Valley Green study, uh, study on green frogs. So that's arrived in the source next to it called own cloud dash credit. So it's telling the library where it's come from storage um, and uh, it's arrived. So we start the process of looking at that record, um, we go into it and then we start working on it. And Chris showed you before there's various things you know, that the library works on. Um, so we can add lots of information there through a conversation with the researcher as well. So that's basically how it works. Um, this is just demonstrating that the information from the crate comes over and is populated as, as put in by the researcher into various sections uh, in this system. When we're finished, we hit the button to publish the record. So this is where we do it, and the record is published across to our institutional repository. Uh, and it just shows that it's actually been published. So finally, um, after the tip publish button, it arrives in Nova. So it has behind the scenes, it's uh, sending receives over as well, and it's harvested from there. We harvest it up to uh, Research Data Australia. Um, so I guess the last thing I would say, so that's the process, so that's the three workflows and that's how they're connected from the research storage and cloud through the red box mic to the library, uh, through to uh, discovery on the other end, uh, which is facilitated through Nova with that connection back into research data storage um, if it's applicable. So lastly, um, I would mention that um, uh, I've, I've said that uh, there's been a number of iterations um, with development on the Crater tool, uh, and Arnet are currently funding further development um, and enhancements to the tool uh, at the moment, um, which they'll be trialling with Cloud Store Plus. So if there's a group um, that's working on that. So obviously Arnet, uh, Intercept are doing the development, and also uh, University of Western Sydney and University of Newcastle, because we've been working on this uh, for quite a while uh, now. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you, Vicky. If anybody has any questions for Vicky, can you put them in the... Uh... Oh, no, oh, this one here already. It says, once a project is complete and all creatable data is packaged and up, packaged up and published and archived, how do you ensure researchers go back and delete all remaining redundant data in own cloud? I have to actually, um, it would be a, pol a policy or a business rule within um, IT and I actually don't know the answer to what we actually do here. With, when you're selecting the files to add to a crate picky, what ha does it track where they are? Does it can, if a re researcher moves them around, does that then become disconnected yeah. from the crate? Yeah, so it was fairly quick. So I did talk about, um, it was fairly quick on the screen, it flashed up, there was that one of the um, icons across the top uh, in the navigation in Crate, it was a, a, a button that was check. And the demonstration I just did, it, it validated. But what the purpose of that is, it's, it's like um, it's checking to see if the names have changed, if the files have been removed, and, and is, it, is it exactly that, because it's referencing where those files are in, from the files actually in you know, so it, I presume then the advice would be to sort of structure a, a location pretty much where you're going to have it and set it and not change with it too much. Yeah, but if, if you do, you just have to do a little bit more, more work when you're going to package it up. All right, so thank you very much for listening to me this morning. Um, today I'm going to focus on, just like everybody else, storing, accessing and exposing research data at, at JCU. And 
storage, um, we have quite a few different options that we make available to different researchers. So um, we have HPC. So um, all researchers can apply for an account on the HPC and, in, and depending upon what they want to do, um, they can use it for just storage or also for, for compute purposes. Um, JCU is very fortunate to be an RDSI regional node. So this gives us a um, two petabytes of, of disk storage that we have here. Like here. And um, access to the RDSI storage is available through an application process. And um, we tend to encourage people who want access to larger disk storage to apply for an RDS application. And the other storage we have is a system called Research Data, which is really, it's, it's a red box. It's publicly exposed and um, this one's designed for completed data sets. So that as there's a self-submission process that, or workflow that the users can go through they, so they can um, complete their records, they can attach files with a total size of up to 50 megabytes. So this is typically things like um, Excel spreadsheets um, and zip files that we normally see. So I'll just move on to my next slide. I was, the other thing I was about to say is um, E-research e can also store files in, on a system that need to be kept private um, and we can expose them in different ways as well depending upon which system the users want to use. So for access, again HPC um, standard access applies. Um, SSH, SCP, FTP, some of this um, is um, a bit challenging for some users. So we try and use other systems to make access to their storage easier. Um, and this is very helpful to us. Um, we have, we can, I guess for, for RDS storage, we can mount that on the HPC for processing or, or compute access. Um, we have quite a large number of users here at JCU who are making or are using Spera shares. So for those of you who don't know, this is um, web-based access um, to RDSI storage, and this is this can be for tens of terabytes of data if you wish. Um, this has been very helpful to some users in that if they're at a um, at a location where connectivity is poor, um, Aspera Shares has been able to give them good throughput in terms of uploading their data and accessing it. There is also a functionality to provide a sync type um, functionality using Aspera, but as um, Christopher pointed out quite earlier, um, it's dependent upon you having the local storage available, especially with you, if you're dealing with many terabytes of data. Uh, Mediafax gives us lots of options. Uh, we're focusing on portals functionality for Mediafax, and we're currently working with Architecta on improving this. So it's a way that we can quickly create a, a mini portal to expose research data and to have um, access restrictions on that. And we can also um, create virtual machines um, to expose research data via different um, different websites, if, if the, depending upon the projects or the requirements of the user. Oops, and, and as I said, the other one, the other option is um, I mentioned earlier is research data where we can attach the 50 megs or up to 50 megs uh, exposure. So this is where we tie it all, all together, and mostly at JCU, uh, the system for exposing it is. Is, a, is research data, which is our Redbox instance. Uh, so it's probably available and um, there's a feed that happens once a week where ANS harvest the records for Research Data Australia. There's another system called the JCU Research Portfolio that is used and um, records from uh, research data are, are um, displayed under a tab on um, Research Portfolio. And um, this is to provide information about JC researchers, but also to see um, what sort of research data is available from those researchers. And um, the information in the research portfolio is built using um, the JC research management system. So maybe I'd just like to give a, a bit of a quick demo if I can switch to my web browser. Sorry. So just to try and show how it all ties in. Here's our publicly facing. Uh, Redbox instance. So uh, I've pre-searched for a record that I know has got some links to data. So 
So we're just reliant on the researchers adding URLs to explain to expose where the data may be. And um, in this example here, there's a, a public link to where the actual publication has been made, but the data is stored with that publication. And also here, there's a link to um, Inside Air Research, which is and actually this data sitting on our um, HPC, so the user can then download their zip files. And again, if there's something similar for data on RDSI, we can expose that data using a similar method. So if we I will show you just jcu.me. So this is the research portfolio. So if you go to jcu.me, it redirects to here. So you can search for a researcher. So um, we can go just use Jeremy Vanderwell, who has lots of records. And um, if, as I said, if they have any data in our in our red box system or research data, this tab will be generated, and you can um, select the records from in here. So what we can do is then click on the record. It's very, this, I am live, so let's have a look. Here we go. So this is just a um, just a listing of the information you would see in Redbox. And if you wanted to, you can go off to the actual Redbox. Actually, this is a this is the actual data. So here's a, just a directory listing of the data that you can download. As we've probably all seen this before, but um, here are just the records that Jeremy has in um, Research Data Australia. I'll just pick... Um, so let's say some of his bird information. So we click on data provider. So same links, similar type links. I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. I'd like to open it up for questions, please. Through for you yet, but while we're waiting for ones to come through from uh, for Jay, um, I'll go back to one of the ones that was for Vicky, which was do you, how much training support do you offer for your staff, Vicky? In terms of um, we well, yes, use staff, I'm just I'm assuming I'm I'm um, maybe incorrectly that you're talking about researchers in terms of their use of cloud and, and create it. Um, so what we did to kick that off a little while ago, actually it was last year, was we ran a, um, a workshop where we got, actually when we were um, introducing own cloud and actually um, trialling uh, create it with a lot of researchers to come and mainly for the purpose of giving feedback. So we did a lot through that session. Um, we have a, a, there's online help and a guide and, and in context uh, in own cloud uh, and the N4 creator. And so yeah, we've got, at the moment we've got four to five, somewhere between 400 and 500 um, users uh, on uh, own cloud. And as part of that process, they have to go through a um, uh, an orientation session. So we're actually trying to, IT actually, uh, deliver that to them, so they put that location together and then there's this um, session that they go to and we're trying just transferring that on online so just to actually get some information to orientate them and then they get access to it. So, okay, so they should be know what to do at the time they start. Yeah. Okay, um, one back now for Jay. It says, do you link AAF credentials with LDAP for HPC use? No, we don't. So uh, our HPC use is um, restricted to JCU researchers or people who are enrolled at the university or work here. Um, on the, I guess that question was probably asked around data access. If I can talk about Aspera shares a little bit more, um, we can provide a wider range of access to data that's exposed by that system. So our Aspera shares is um, hooked into an LDAP that's managed by QCIF. So for those of you who don't know, QCIF managed Chris Cloud, so JCU works closely with QCIF. And um, they have a portal. Anyone who um, is a member of the AAF can log on to Chris Cloud and in there obtain um, Chris Cloud credentials. And provided they've then given access to an allocation, um, they can then access, they can log on to our shares machine or the one based in Brisbane if there's storage in there and access the data that way. So via shares, we can give people access from outside the university, but QCIF also have a mechanism that they can provide access for people who are overseas as well. So they can create accounts in there. Okay. Um, and another one for Jay. Do you also have SSH, SCP type access to the Aspera shares, or is it web only? Good question. Um, Aspera shares is web only. Uh, the, the infrastructure underneath 
is it is possible to get I get SCP access to um, that storage. We usually do it by um, mounting it on um, let's say the HPC for instance that storage and then and it can be accessed that way. Um, we haven't actually exposed the, there are two servers that manage the shares infrastructure, sit behind shares. It is possible to, to expose them using that, but it has not been done. I can add to that too. From Deca's perspective, we have an um, interactive, interactive box that's attached to our storage, and so that's how they can get SCP, SSH access to download. And they can run things, <coughs> technical tools like screen or whatever. So if they've got a sequence file they want to download and it takes a while, they can just set it going and come back later. Right. So that's that's yes. been taken up quite well. Now this one's back for Vicky. Vicky, it says, um, is the crate owned by an individual or a project? From the interface, I would guess an individual in own cloud. Um, it's, it, it is an individual and um, with it, as you know with OwnCloud you can actually invite people to share the crate so we'll share the, um, the environment so multiple people can be, have access to it. And then for Jay, you mentioned MediaFlux, have you been able to get this operational? That sounds uh, okay. like uh, Okay, we've spent a lot of time working on MediaFlux um, and I mentioned that our main focus has been on the portals functionality. We've found so far that the presentability of those portals isn't very good with regards to being able to customise CSS. But um, we're about to, well, we've been working closely with them. They're, I think development's about to start very soon that will um, allow us to give, have full control of the CSS inside those portals to expose the data. Um, I do have a couple of data sets in MediaFlux, but it's a, um, I guess watch this space, that's all I can say. Um, we do, I, I think it has great potential, but it needs, you, it needs some developer resources to spend more time on it. And that's, that will probably be me. <laughs> okay, here's a question for all the speakers. It says, what sort of processes or services do you envisage developing on top of this storage service? There was a question around data deletion. Would data curation be a process or service to build on top? So perhaps Vicky, if you wanted to start that. Can you just repeat the question for me, please? Sure. It says, for all speakers, what sort of processes or services do you envisage developing on top of this storage service? There was a question around data deletion. Would data curation be a process or service to build on top? Yeah, that's a hard one. Um, maybe easier for um, Christopher and um, Jay to answer. We haven't really had any further um, discussion around what we might um, build on top, I guess. Um, so I'm not really going to comment on that because I don't have anything concrete to, to actually say. But in my mind, you know, what I would like to see in, in terms of what we already have here and is that from looking into the future and I've got a crystal ball and you know, it's, it's less than five years but it's more than two, I would just like to see a lot of the processes around um, the, the point of data storage and, and publication of um, absolutely streamlined and that there's less involvement and, and, and by individuals and people and it's a lot more um, automated. So that's what I would like to see. So hopefully um, that's the sort of service that I think that we should sort of be aiming for. So to put more um, time and effort into processes and um, things that actually automate and take ourselves out of the way of the researcher so they're more in control of that. So that's really what I would like. But that's really probably not answering the question in, in the way that um, it was asked. <laughs> well, thanks, Vicky. How about you, Jay? Uh, interesting question. I guess um, we're probably not there yet here at JCU. Uh, for instance, like in our red box, we're capturing time frames in which people want data to be retained for, but we're not actually any of that at the moment. Um, as far as maybe to answer the data curation side of things, when, particularly with um, records submitted via Redbox, uh, our librarian is um, reviewing the records, but then we also have a look at inside, let's say, the spreadsheets and things to see if their um, columns are neatly labelled and that people can understand the data that's in there um, for external use. But um, yeah, I think we're, we're not quite there yet either with regards to those sorts of issues. Okay, and, and Chris. Yeah, we're sort of similar to that. Most of the energy has been invested in, as I was saying earlier, making people aware that the service is there and how it's, 
how we would advise for that discipline um, that they could use it. Um, <laughs> I think it'd be a luxurious position to be in to focus on <laughs> the latter that you're, the question sort of talks to. Um, and, and in terms of curation, so really the, the, the direction I've been providing there is saying, well, you need to you need to be working with best practice in your discipline. So if you're unaware of that, then we can we can work with you to come up with something and propose that. Um, just a preservation, um, and that is a deep and like you could do a PhD on that. <laughs> um, at the moment, we're really telling people, look, stick with common denominators. So don't go to if you're going bespoke, you need to think about the environments that you would potentially need to access that in five years' time, and it is really rapidly changing. So if you if you're choosing a vendor with your data analysis or capture, that potentially I don't know, may go bust or the technology may change three or four iterations, you may not actually be able to use that um, in the future. So that, that's something that we need to consider. We haven't really invested a lot of time and energy into that. Okay. You raised a lot we, of very valid points. Yeah, we're just, just about out of time here. So I'm yes, going so to have just one last very, very small question, which is for all three of them. Can, uh, students, especially PhD students, access these services to store their research data. Yes. yes. Jay's yes. going yes, Vicky's going yes, and Christopher's going yes. Fantastic, wonderful way to finish. Paul, back to you. Thank you. Those are wonderful questions, and, and thank you for all the uh, panel speakers who uh, who provide uh, the insight and thought and experience. Uh, it has been very uh, thought-provoking, certainly.